You may be seated. Good morning, everyone. Get all my papers in order. At the first service, I told them I still had vacation brain. It's cleared up a little bit, so I think, I think I've got my act together. If you wouldn't mind, you take your connection card out of your bulletin and fill it out. It's a way that you can let us know you were here. If you have any prayer requests or questions or other information to pass on to the office, this is a place to do it. And on the back, there are some, other, some information about some ways to get involved. You can find more about those all in your bulletin, um, but just a few that we want to highlight this morning. One of those is a backpack project. We are looking to um, fill uh, 25 backpacks full of school supplies for kids. We're not going to do a full school supply drive this year because there are lots of other organizations doing that, and we don't need to duplicate all of our efforts, and also because we're looking at um, sort of adopting a school for the whole year, and more information on that will be coming soon. Um, so this is just a, a just-in-case we get information, we folks come to the church, or we hear from teachers and schools around that they have a kid who needs supplies, we'll have some on hand, um, but it's not just a full school, big school supply drive. Um, information on that is, is here on this insert that's in your bulletin. You can uh, take a look at that, and if you are interested in helping, there's a box to check on your connection card. Um, Camp First is almost over. Uh, our last week is this, this Thursday. We're going to be at TJ Evans Park, um, and I hear it's a fishing day. Pete? And so I, uh, I wore my uh, socks with lures on them. I thought it would be appropriate for the season. I, I, sometimes I try to match liturgically, and sometimes I try to match other things. Yeah. Barb got me some, Pastor Barb got me some I Love Jesus print socks. So those will be making an appearance. You never know when. Um, so if you are interested in helping at Camp First this week for our final week, we would love it. You have so much fun, and you will be exhausted. Um, but also, just want to say thank you to everyone who has helped volunteer or provide, um, provide supplies that have made camp a big success this year. Um, we could not have done it without your help. Um, if you are interested in the candle lighters luncheon, that will be resuming in the fall, in October. Uh, but there's a group that will be meeting next Sunday between the services, 10-15, uh, to sort of plan what the luncheon will look like. Um, now that it's been getting started up again after a couple years, there's a lot to do, a lot to plan. And so if you are interested in that, um, just come and hang out in the chapel with them to uh, figure out all of those details next Sunday. And then, I want to keep in our prayers all of the folks who are, who've been affected by the flooding in Kentucky uh, over the last week. Um, if you are interested in helping to provide um, support for those folks, you can go and to donate to UMCOR. You, you can write a check and mark UMCOR in the memo line for us, or you can go online, umcmission.org slash UMCOR. And that will take you to a place. And the, the option you'll choose is U.S. disaster response. Um, it's just one bucket that all of the funds go into. Um, and if you have any questions about what sort of work will be happening and if there's a way you can get involved in other ways than financially, give Jeff Walker a call because he's the guy who 
will know all of the details. Um, he's our conference disaster response coordinator, and he's got a big job. Um, but we're grateful to, to have his work. And then also, if you are buying school supplies this year, if you know anyone who's buying school supplies, um, the tax-free weekend is this coming weekend. And as a shameless plug to help support the mi ministries of the church, we have our gift cards, our script cards out there. Um, who do we talk to right now after this service? Does anyone know? Kayla's not here. We'll figure it out. But if you're interested, call the office tomorrow if you're interested. Um, you can buy gift cards from us. We get them at a, at, a, at a discounted rate, but you get the full face value of it. So you buy at the face value, and you, part of that is a donation to the church to help the ministries of the church, and then you get the gift card, and then you can use it this weekend to buy tax-free school supplies or certain clothing items for the children in your life who are attending school or if you know anyone who has those children. Um, so that's a great way to get what you need and to help the church. And that's all of our announcements. Wonderful. Because the next, obviously, the, the last announcement was volunteers to help pack lunches for Salvation Army, but that happened between services. So um, if anyone's interested in helping to pass out those dinners uh, for the Salvation Army, you can head down to the Salvation Army about 5 o'clock um, this, this afternoon. I'm sure you will be welcomed with open arms and your help will be appreciated. But now if you uh, stand if you are able or if you want and we will continue our worship as we sing Make Us One. In your image we were made Together one we come to sing your praise Creation's cry Falling down before the God who reigns as three.
be seated. Would you pray with me? Lord, today we do pray that you would let your kingdom come. That we would know that you are building your kingdom here, right now, in this very place, and in our lives. That wherever we find ourselves and we love one another in your name that there we find your kingdom so Lord help us the one body to be one in you to not just come here on this morning to sing songs and to lift up our voices in praise of you but to let our lives reflect your goodness and your grace. Lord, help us to know that wherever we find ourselves, we have a chance to share your your love with one another. To reach out with a helping hand, to offer comfort and care show compassion to offer a word of hope just as you have done those things Lord help us to do them for your children help us to know that we have been called and are sent by you for that purpose to offer back into the world the gifts that Jesus has given to us. Lord, may it be so that that whenever we encounter anyone, whether we have known that person for years or just have met them or if we might never meet them again, we can share the outpouring of your love, that our lives would overflow with your goodness so that the world might know who you are, might know that wherever we find ourselves, we are never far from you. So this we pray, knowing that just as you have called us back, that you will never let us go. Amen. Our scripture reading today is from the book of Hosea, chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. When Israel was a child, I loved him, And out of Egypt I called my son. But the more they were called, the more they went away from me. They sacrificed to the Baals, and they burned incense to images. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by the arms. But they did not realize it was I who healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with ties of love. To them I was like one who lifts a little child to the cheek, and I bent down to feed them. Will they not return to Egypt, and will not Assyria rule over them because they refuse to repent? A sword will flash in their cities. It will devour their false prophets and put an end to their plans. My people are determined to turn from me, 
Even though they call me God Most High, I will by no means exalt them. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? How can I treat you like Adma? How can I make you like Zeboim? My heart is changed within me. All my compassion is aroused. I will not carry out my fierce anger, nor will I devastate Ephraim again. For I am God and not a man, the Holy One among you. I will not come against their cities. They will follow the Lord. He will roar like a lion. When he roars, his children will come trembling from the west. They will come from Egypt, trembling like sparrows from Assyria, fluttering like doves. I will settle them in their homes, declares the Lord. The word of God for the people of God. Lord, we ask that you be with us, and may my words be yours. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Chords of kindness. Well, actually, too, in these chords of kindness that tie us all back comes the thing of being lost. When I taught school, I was in an extended contract. That meant I had to go two weeks before school started and two weeks after school started, after it ended, excuse me. And in that, I was to make home visits to make sure that our students were doing their home economics piece. It was the vocational home economics contract that I had, and I was to see how they were living that out in their, their home lives. Well, I taught school in Sugar Grove, and it's down, I don't know if you know that area, but it is down in southern Fairfield County, almost to Hawking County. So it's over the river and through the woods. And a lot of the places down through there are, mm, that's where I became Phil familiar with Coon Path and where I became familiar with Possum Hollow and where, you know, all of these kind of roads that were roads, well, they said they were, they had road names, but some of them looked like mm, they were just little trails. But I was supposed to go out and I was supposed to visit my students and I was supposed to make a report. Well, and I'm also, I found out that the reason I would get car, I got car sick, even when I drove, um, because of my astigmatism. And so that was there, and I didn't understand that was my eyes were not focusing just exactly right, and then I would get car sick. And so I didn't like these rows that went, up and down and over and around and twist and twine and everything. And when I taught, it was before cell phones, before GPSs, before all we had were maps. Imagine that. And maps were not my forte. As you can probably tell by the way I'm telling the story. And I would sometimes have the map upside down. Oh, and what was supposed to be a road I thought was a path, oh, it was awful. And so I was out after school, and I'm trying to make these home visits. And I become so lost that I didn't know where I was. I mean, I was so lost in one of these little country roads and out in the middle of nowhere, and all I could see were trees and grass and hills. I was like, oh my gosh. And I was in my 1973 Plymouth Valiant. Some of you remember those years. 
And so I was in my Plymouth Valiant, and I just pull over to the side of the road, and I start crying because I have no idea where I am. I don't have any idea how I'll ever get back to school. I don't have any idea where the kid's house was. I don't have any idea. I'm stuck. And I start crying. And I'm crying, going, oh, Lord, I don't know where I am. I don't know where you are, but I don't know how to get home. I'm, I'm lost. Please help me, Lord. Well, lo and behold, the Lord sent a driver's ed car. When I was teaching school, that was when we taught driver's ed in the schools. And they would take a driver's ed car out, and they would do driving in the summer with the driver's ed teacher. And so the, this ed teacher was also the driver's ed teacher of that school, and he had a group of kids, teenagers, out driving the hills of southern Fairfield County, up and down. And they didn't think it was anything strange because they grew up in it, and they knew the roads, and they thought it was cool. So here I'm pulled over to the side, and the driver's ed car comes putting by. And they pull over, and they go, Miss Wood, are, are you lost? And I went, yes. And they could see I'd been crying. So now the kids in the, back of the fair, in the back of the driver's ed car are laughing hysterically. Miss Woods lost. <laughs> How dumb can she be? <laughs> and the driver's ed teacher is there, and he's just going, um, do, do, you want, do you want a uh, way back to school? And I said, I don't care. Just get me back to civilization. We can take you back to school. I said, okay, I'll follow you. So we, they get in, I pull my car out, and I find my way back to school finally, where I knew where I was, being lost. And then you've heard me tell the story about how our daughter, when she was small, our youngest daughter, ran onto the elevator when we were in a, the hotel in Washington, D.C., and started riding up and down the elevator, and we couldn't find her. She was lost. She told us we were lost. And then there's the loss that we have. When my mother turned 90, something happened. I don't know what it was. It we had all been to a big family gathering, and we came home, and she seemed okay that day. But when she came home, something clicked or unclicked. And the next morning, she got up and made breakfast for people nobody else could see. Her memory had just gone. She was lost. My mom was lost. And with that, you know, we went back that Christmas. That happened at Thanksgiving. And then at Christmas we went. And my mom didn't know who my dad was. My mom didn't know who we were. Our oldest daughter was 18 then, and she called her by my name. She was lost. Hosea knew what it was like to have that feeling of people being lost from him. If we look at chapter 3, it tells us about how Hosea has Gomer. Um, chapter, as we heard yes, last week, um, we heard about God tells Hosea that he is to marry this prostitute and that she is to have children and they have children. And then 
God tells them what to name the children. And they name one Jezreel because there was, I will break my bow and it'll be there. And so a broken relationship with Jezreel. The next one that's born is called Lo-Ravon and it means not loved. And the last one's called lo Ami, which is not my people. So it's like, oh my goodness, you give me these children with a woman who's a prostitute and what a broken heart that must be. And we learned that that was the relationship that also it was a parallel relationship that God had with the people Israel. And with that relationship was that brokenness. People were lost. Hosea knows that feeling. He even has his wife in chapter 3 we read that his wife Gomer runs away. She literally leaves him at home with three small children. Now, when Jeff and I got married, we were older, and we had our first child in our late 30s. And so our first child did not change our lifestyle very much at all. I mean, she just became incorporated in what we did. We went gallery hopping. We went to all of our adult things. She just came with us. She was a part of it. We didn't do anything different. And then two years later came our second child, and everything stopped. And I remember going, why can't we do this? I don't understand. And somebody said, it's because you have a baby in your arms and a two-year-old clung to your hip and you're walking like Quasimodo. <laughs> and uh, the two-year-old who had been controllable now was not controllable. And we, did, we didn't dare take her in the galleries where there were fine things to break. Oh my gosh, no, she'd grab them and they'd be broken and we'd have to pay for them. So I only had two kids, but here Hosea has three and he's at home by himself trying to raise these kids, trying to understand what's going on. And God says to him, go after Gomer. And bring her back home. What? Are you kidding me? I have to go over after that wife who lost, left me and is out with it. She left me for another man. She's out with him. And you know what? That guy was just awful too. And he sold her in slavery. She's up on the block for auction. And you want me to go after her? And God's answer is, yes. Go after her. So Hosea, who is faithful, goes after her. And with everything that he has, he buys her back. And he brings her home. And her heart for him is opened. Because he loved her when she didn't even love herself. And I'm not sure, <laughs> I'm not sure. It's one of those feelings, you know, you get when you have that love. You have a child that maybe gets lost. And they come back home and you go, I'm so glad you're home. Now I'm going to kill you. Don't ever do that again. But it's like, Oh, but we're glad you're home. Oh, oh. So he brings her home. And then God also talks to him, and that's what the scripture we have today, is that God talks to Hosea and says, you now know what it feels like to have that lost love to have those people that you had put your trust in leave you. You have compassion and understanding where I am because that's what happened to me. My people did not listen to me. My people did not love me. My people, I called them mine and I 
gave them a land, and yet they turn to idols, and they do other things, and they say, I don't need you, God, and they move away, but still I love them just like you did your wife, and I am going to go after them. So Hosea knows, like God, knows what it's like to have family separated. He knows what's God going, what God is going through. And maybe some of you know what it's like to have that separation in your life. To be separated from somebody that you love. Maybe you are the one that is lost. Maybe it's somebody from your family that is lost. But you know what that separation's like. And it's hard. And it's painful. But the good news is... The good news is that God comes to us and God is consistent with us. And our point three is that God continues to love us even though and through heartbreaking experiences. He loves us even when we hurt him even when we've been nasty, even when we've turned away, God still continues to love us and to come after us and says, come home, come home, come home. God wants us to know that he is there for us. And his love perseveres even in the hardest of times. It perseveres. He never gives up on the Israel. He never gives up on us. So much that he sent his son Jesus into the world. Sent his son Jesus so that we might know, so that we might have life, so that we might have forgiveness. Like Jesus goes after, Jesus goes after, tells the story of going after the one that's lost from the 99. He goes after him. He's the one that says, welcome home, prodigal son. He's the one that says, the woman who is being stoned, those without sin, you throw the first stone. And then he tells her, oh, your sins are forgiven. Go and sin no more. He's always there with this open door trying to say, come home, come home. So much so that the scriptures tell us in John Chapter 14, it says, In my Father's house there are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go there and prepare a place for you? And where I go to prepare a place for, I will come again and take you to be with me. What a great gift, a home. Now maybe some of you don't, have not experienced that kind of home that is warm and friendly. But I'm telling you, God's got a home a home for you, a place where you can come, where you can be restored. At the end of my mom's life, she lived four years without, with this Alzheimer's or whatever happened. We aren't sure what it was. It wasn't a stroke. We kind of went through all the testing and it still didn't show what was going on. She didn't know who my dad was. She... She didn't know who we were. Once in a while, we get glimpses. She seemed to be happy. I remember one time I'd taken lunch down for them, and my mom, she patted my hand at the end of lunch, and she said, this has been a day to remember. And I got in the car and cried all the way home, thinking, Mother, if you could only remember. you could only remember. My mom and dad were married one month short of being 74 years. 
And you see, they both wore hearing aids, and my dad went to bed late at night, and my mom went to bed early in the morning, and I said they never could hear each other, so that was why they were able to stay married for 74 years. And they were on different schedules. There was a lot of love in there with them, but they, they had that mis miscommunication a lot of times. And one night at the end of her life, close to the end of her life, she had gone to bed early, and Daddy had gone to bed late, and the hearing aids were both out. Mother, who was not prim and proper, but a very proper person, got up. We don't know what time. We're figuring it must have been around 5 in the morning. She got up, and for some reason, putting her shoes and socks on every day was something she had to do. And so she put her shoes and socks on, she put her glasses on, she put her shirt on. She had her panties on, but she forgot her pants. And she went out the front door of our house. Dad didn't hear a thing. And when he woke up, mother was gone. And so he called my brother, who was across the road in the, the farm, and said, Mom's gone. And my brother said, she's passed away. He goes, no, she's gone. And my brother said, I'll be right over. So he came over, and he traced her steps through the dew. They lived on 10 acres. There was a ravine between our house and the, the next-door neighbor's house. And somehow or another, my mom did not fall in the ravine. I think it was God's grace. But she made it over to the neighbor's house and she was going to knock on the door and she tripped on the sidewalk and hit her head on the cement sidewalk. And she had a subdural hematoma. She had a bleeding of the brain. And so my, my brother calls me and said they're going to transfer her from southern Ohio to Grant and the day was a foggy day, so we can't life flight her, but we're going to take her by ambulance. You know hospitals, you go take care of mother with your, your sister. Okay, my brother's the oldest. O okay, we listen. And so we went, and we met mother at the hospital. And she kind of, there was some kind of recognition of who we were. And we said, Mama... And she said, oh, give me a hug. And so we hugged her. Well, she got to come home for a day, but it's something with the, they thought it had stopped, bleeding had stopped, but it started back up again. And so she went in the hospital close to home. Again, my brother kind of took care of my dad. My dad was not able to walk. We said, mother was mobile, daddy wasn't mobile, daddy could think, mother couldn't think. They made a whole unit together. But, so my brother kind of stayed with my dad. And we said, daddy, do you want to go see mama? Because they've put her in hospice. They said the brain bleed's going to continue. And that will take her life. He looked at us and he said, no, no, the mother, your mother has been gone for the last four years because of her mental state. He said, I said goodbye to her back then. We said, okay. So my sister and I stayed at the hospital for the week that she was there. And as she deteriorated, we were the ones that kind of washed her face. We played, changed the role. The mother who had taken care of us so well and had nursed us through all kinds of things, we became the one that nursed her. And we, we helped her and, and, you know, we apologized for the ways that we were awful to her. Now knowing what it's like to be a parent, we knew how bad we had been as kids. Oh, Mama, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry I hurt your feelings on some of those things. I'm sorry. And we kind of went through those times to say we were sorry. And, and she, it came the time that she passed. And we were both there. And we both cried. But do you know what, in the midst of that, 
we remembered that in her death, she was healed. In her death, she was put back together. In her death, she knew who her sisters were that had gone before us and knew who her brothers were that were before her. She knew who her mother and her grandmother were, and she was loving them, and she was restored, and she was brand new. And so the mother who had struggled in being lost was now found, and Jesus was with her, and she was with Jesus, and she was rejoicing, for she could remember. And so we celebrated. My mama knew. My dad passed three years later. And my, my niece, Katie, said when, when Grandpa was dying, she said, you know what? Grandma's going to be there, and she's going to go, Welcome home, Willard! And we're sure she did. Because even um, through, like I said, they had their little tiffs, 74 years, come on. But they still she still giggled, and he still had that sly smile, and they still held hands. They were restored to who they were and how God had created them. And that's what happens when we allow God to restore us just as he did the Israelites, just as he does with Jesus, just as he does with us, that when we say yes to him and are restored, we're brought into a home where we're loved and we're put back together and we're whole. And we're held. And he says, you're mine. And he doesn't leave us. His love perseveres. when we are lost and we've gone to the wrong place or we're lost in our own thoughts or we're lost with our loved ones God says persevere I am with you you are not lost for I am with you and I will be your guide just let me in just let me do it let me show you the way and he will send you the driver's ed car well, maybe, hopefully not the driver's ed car with a bunch of teenagers taking you back home. But he will take you back home. He will take you back home. And count on him that the lost are still loved and his arms are still open and there are always second chances. And there's always love. And there's restoration. Count on him. Let us pray. Oh, Lord, we are so thankful for your son. Jesus, who has broken the bonds of, of sin and death and gives us life and hope and promise, who lets us have a chance to start again, be a new creation, have hope and promise when we think that there is none, who sees that there is a way to come home, a way to come home. And even when we're not lovable, he still loves us and says, you're mine. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Let us stand and sing our closing hymn. We bow our hearts. We bend. Our Oh, Spirit, come in.
Seeking his face, being a part of that family, knowing he's bringing us back home with love and care, and there is a place for us with him. Go in his name. Amen.